If you will, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 10, and we'll be spending a majority of our time today in Luke chapter 10 trying to understand what it means to love our neighbors. Seems to be that's something that's on the mind of our country, at least. The state of Texas has been destroyed by natural disasters. Currently, as we sit here this morning, on September the 10th of 2017, the state of Florida is under an imminent weather disaster, a Category 4 hurricane that sits wider than the state is currently hovering over the bottom part of Florida. Other parts of our country are on fire. Other parts of our country are divided by social issues. And it begs us to ask the question, what does it mean to love our neighbor? As we go through our discussion this morning, we'll have four things that we're going to look at. Number one, we're going to see the justification, and this is going to pick us up in Luke chapter 10. Then we're going to see, as we go through the answer, Jesus is going to respond to this lawyer and give him the answer of which he did not expect. And then we're going to see the question. Jesus is going to ask a question, and he's going to make this lawyer answer, which one did what was right? And then we're going to notice in the fourth place the reality. How does all this play out? What does it mean for you and me? How do we love our neighbors? And, and we're going to ask the question, as that lawyer did, who is our neighbor? But what we're going to do is we're going to understand, as that lawyer understood, our neighbors exist right among us. But I want us to get to the reality of what's happening here. As you know, as you begin in Luke chapter 10, as you start in verse 25, as we begin to talk about the justification, a lawyer comes to Jesus. The text says this way, Luke 10, 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's impressive to me how many questions inside of Scripture begin with what shall I do to inherit eternal life when referred to Jesus. You see verse 26, Jesus answered and said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? This man of the law would have known. And verse 27, And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Notice verse 28 and 29. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, talking about the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You see, the question begins rather innocently if we had not known that the lawyer stood up to tempt Jesus. For the question is a very noble question. What shall I do, verse 25? Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It tells us a reality. We need to be involved in questions concerning eternal life. You see, this life is not it. And this lawyer who stood up to tempt Jesus at least understood this. This life is not all there is to live. And he asked Jesus, what shall I do? And it's impressive what Jesus does. He says, what does the Scripture say? What does the law say? How do you read the law? And thus the lawyer repeats it to him in verse 27. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, number one. With all thy soul, number two. With all thy strength, number three. And then he says, and with all thy mind, number four. And number five, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus tells him something. Maybe the answer he was not expecting when he went to tempt Jesus Jesus says in verse 28, Thou hast answered right. You're correct, in other words. You came to tempt me, but you answered correctly. This do, 
and thou shalt live. But notice verse 29. This is why we call it the justification passage. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You see, many times our world lives just as this lawyer lived. We look around our world and, and we understand something. We understand that we have to dedicate ourselves to God. That's the introductory matters here of this lawyer who answered Jesus, What saith the law? The first part of that is dedicate yourself to God. That's why he says you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, with everything you have. You dedicate yourself unto God. You see, the lawyer was right. We need to dedicate ourselves to God, but the lawyer gives it just to correct in the second statement. And thy neighbor as thyself. We need to understand that we are not the only people living in this world. That's something the lawyer seemed to understand. It's definitely something the law was telling the lawyer to understand. But we're many times like the lawyer. And many times our world is like this. And we ask the question, but who is my neighbor? And we try to justify our lives to make our lives fit the Word of God. Or really what we try to do is we try to make the Word of God fit our lives. The justification. As you continue on in this particular scene, you see the answer. And this is something that's very familiar to many of us as we begin in Luke 10, verse 30. Jesus answering this man saying, or answering the question, who is my neighbor, says this. A certain man went down from Jericho, or from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance... There came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, in other words, and likewise by chance, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, notice this, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring oil and pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him and on the morrow when he departed he took two pence and gave to the host and said to him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when i come again i will repay thee you see the answer jesus gives is not the answer that this certain lawyer was looking for the lawyer was trying to tempt Jesus, was trying to trick Jesus into saying something that he should not. Remember as we began, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, but he gets a very matter-of-fact question and answer series with Jesus himself. What does the law say, Jesus said? The lawyer comes back and says, who is my neighbor? And this grand illustration is given it's very simple. We understand it. We've heard it since we were a child. We remember it as being children if we were reared in the church. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. There was a man who was traveling, but unfortunately to him, he ran into a band of thieves. And they took everything he had, even his clothing, and they beat him. And they left him there in a position for half dead. In other words, he could not on his own get all the way down to Jericho. He couldn't move any further. He was in need of help. The answer is to this question, who is my neighbor, we're going to find out. Now notice this. And by chance there came a certain priest that way. If anyone should have had compassion under the Old Testament system, it would have been a priest. A man who would have known the law of God. A man who would have dedicated his life to the service of God. He just happened to come by the way that this man came. Notice what happened, verse 31. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Have you ever been driving down the road and, and you were trying to figure out what it was in front of you? That's what this man was doing. He wasn't driving, but as he was walking down the road, he saw in a distance something in front of him. And the text tells us when he realized what it was, and when he saw him, 
Saul who? Saul, this man who was left half for dead. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. You see, a, a priest, a man who should have had compassion, lacked it. He goes on to tell in this particular scene, a Levite, another man who was a man of God, when he was at the place, in other words, when he got to the point of where this man was, in the very scenes of this man, when he was at the place, and notice this, he came to the man and looked on him and had no compassion. You see, he was not like the priest who saw sort of what was going on and went to the other side of the road. This Levite went right up to the man who was in need and looked on him and passed by on the other side of the road. But then Jesus says this, but a certain Samaritan, a man who would have had nothing to do with a Jew, Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Most likely the man coming from Jerusalem to Jericho was a Jew. The two people who should have helped him, both Jews, should have but didn't. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, notice this, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And what did he do? He took care of the man. He bound up his wounds. He put him on his own transportation, and he got him to a place of safety. Here's how we would say it in modern times. He was a hero. He saved a man's life of which could not save it for himself. He did what no one else was willing to do. But he did even more than that. Verse 35, and on the morrow when he departed... After taking care of this man all night, after paying for the room at the inn, and, and on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Jesus gives the answer, Who's your neighbor? They're all around you. Jesus says they're all around you in every aspect of the right. The people that are around you are your neighbor. The one that you're supposed to love like you love yourself is right beside you. But here's the beauty of this. Jesus gives this question. Which now of these three? Remember, he's responding to this lawyer, the lawyer that stood up and most likely was still standing in this assembly of people. Which of these three, lawyer, thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among thieves. The question. You see, we may be in many cases asking the same question. Who is our neighbor? We know we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We understand that as a principle. We know that. But who are they? And Jesus gives this great grand illustration to show us and to show this lawyer that our neighbors are all around us. And thus he gives that great question, which now of these three, which now of these three thinkest thou, remember? Remember what Jesus asked that lawyer? What says the law or, or how readest thou? How do you think about this, lawyer? He's asking him again, how do you think about this? Of these three, which one was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Then you get the reality of this, and this is what happens in verse 37. And Jesus, or and he said unto him, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. The reality of this statement is the lawyer knew who his neighbors were. The lawyer knew the law, otherwise he would not have been able to say what's found in verse 27. He would have not been able to say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And he would have not been able to say, and thy neighbor as thyself. This lawyer knew who his neighbor was. And many times we know who our neighbors are as well. But we look at Luke chapter 10, and, and we begin there, and we see that the lawyer tempts Jesus in verse 25. And, and we see as you hit verse 37, Jesus tells the lawyer, go be like the Samaritan. 
and to help those that are around you. And sometimes we have the idea in our minds that helping others is the only way we can love our neighbors. Go with me to Romans 13. I want us to see that in Romans chapter 13, a chapter that talks about the government being God's minister for justice, a chapter that spends time talking about justice, I love verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Governments are supposed to be for good. I want you to begin with me in verse 7 and see people, not just governments. And I want you to ask this question. How do we love our neighbors? Yes, we can serve them in their needs. Yes, we can help them when they're down on their luck. But there's something so much more to this. Romans 13, begin with me in verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this cause, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandments, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now notice verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light, the writer says. And he says, let us walk honestly, as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but notice verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let's ask the question. Yes, we can help our neighbor when they're down on their luck. And many of you are a part of that every week. You should know that. You should know that you're a part of helping your fellow neighbor when they're down. That's why the elders have set aside part of our budget to go to benevolence. And thus we help those in the community. Notice this. We help those who we, we help those who are in need. Part of that benevolent budget goes to our food giveaway every year. And you should know we help those in our community. And we'll have that this year in December to help those who are down on their luck. But you know, we're not just here to help those who are down on their luck. We're to help those who are watching. We're to help those that are watching. And thus, when we enter into Romans chapter 13, we get a great lesson. We understand, number one, in verse 7, that we should be willing to give to those who are deserving. The text says, Render therefore all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. We're to live right. We're to do right by our fellow man. He says, verse 8, Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And thus we start to understand what it means to love our neighbors. To love our neighbors means we're going to live the Christian life. We're going to live as Christ would live. And we're going to get to that point in that understanding as we make our way back down to verse 14. Remember, because he says in the ending, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, don't fulfill this lust of the world. Don't fulfill the desires of the world. Don't fulfill the envies of the world. Don't fulfill the flesh. How do we do that? Well, we love one another, verse 8. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Now notice verse 9, and this is why we say we can love our neighbors in living as the Christian would live. Verse 9, for this. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has everything to do with verse 8. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Then he goes for this. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. 
Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, in other words, if there's anything else I've not listed, the writer says, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, it does not have to do with just helping someone who is down. You go back to Luke 10 in your minds, and that Samaritan definitely helped someone who was down on his luck. But you see, we can do so much more than just helping those that are down on our luck. Those that just have need, those that need a little help, we can do so to everyone that watches around us. The priority emphasis of this morning's lesson is the reality that we are supposed to be Christians. And in everything that we do, in everything that we say, in every action that we make is a lesson that someone is learning. Maybe it's the case that as you look at verse 9, you may see these temptations. Maybe it's the temptation of not being faithful. Maybe it's the temptation of ending someone's life. Maybe it's the temptation of taking something that is not yours. Maybe it's the temptation to lie for gain or for self-promotion. Promotion. Maybe you're tempted to covet the things that are not yours. Or maybe you're tempted in other areas in which the writer says, and if there be any other commandment is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The reality is we've got to put somebody else first. Not just when they're down on their luck. Not just when they're hurting, but every day. And we see this reality come because verse 10 says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you want to fulfill the law of Christ? Then love your neighbor when he's down and when he's watching. Verse 10 says, The time, the time is now for us to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore notice this cast off the works of darkness. Let's put sin in its place. Let's put temptation in its place. And let us put on, notice this, the armor of light. You may be sitting here this morning and you may ask this question. Can I really do this? I do not believe the writer of this book would have written, put on the armor of light if it were not there for us to use. Other writers will end up saying, put on the whole armor of God. Notice verse 13. Here's the reality of loving your neighbor. Let us walk honestly. What does it take for a Christian to live the Christian life? What does it take? It takes him being honest. It takes him living honestly before God and before his fellow man. And he tells us this, as in the day, in other words, don't be someone who is of the darkness. Be of someone who is of the light. He's making this contrast of sin and darkness, of light inside of Christ. He says, let us walk honestly as the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife or envying. In other words, not in satisfying the flesh. And he's going to show this, this in verse 14. He says, let us, not, let us walk honestly, not in sin, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill, fulfill the lust thereof. That's the reality of loving your neighbor. Yes, we cannot be in any aspect like the priest who walked by in Luke chapter 10. We cannot be in any aspect like the Levite. Remember the Levite? Not only did he look and see, but he came and saw, and he went by on the other way. But we must be like the Samaritan 
who, who just like the priest and the Levite, saw something in the distance, followed it through. But we must be like the Samaritan who had compassion. But you see, that's not all that is to do with loving your neighbor. Romans chapter 13, 7 through the end of the chapter, tells us that loving your neighbor is living for Christ. Loving your neighbor is not fulfilling the flesh, but is putting on Christ. See, loving your neighbor, and I hope, I hope we do not miss this. I hope we do not miss this. Loving your neighbor is also being the example that someone else needs you to be. And that's tough. Because we live in a world that says do whatever you want to do. We live in a world that says make yourself happy. Isn't it interesting that that's the opposite of Romans 13, 14? Put therefore on Christ and don't fulfill the flesh. Our world says, do whatever you want. Do whatever makes you happy. Be your own person, our world says. But living the life of Christ means pushing off the flesh, pushing off the desires of this world, and living for Christ. That has something to do with loving your neighbor. And I hope we never forget Romans 13 when we talk about Luke chapter 10. Because we have got to be, we must be, the people who live for Christ. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven. Thank you.